A special Iranian envoy arrives in London to protest about the deportation of Iranians from Britain. As he arrived, three more Iranians were sent back to Iran, bringing the total deported so far to 20. But the envoy, presidential press spokesman Mr. Musawi Gamarudi, had nothing to say about his mission at this stage, as Francis Coverdale found at Heathrow Airport. The precise purpose of Mr. Gamarudi's visit is something of a mystery. Even the Foreign Office had had no formal notification, either from Tehran or from the Iranian Embassy in London. According to Paz, the official news agency in Iran, he'll be protesting about the failure of British courts to observe humane principles. But as he arrived at Heathrow Airport, Mr. Gamarudi was not forthcoming. I have nothing to say at the moment. When will you be saying something, Mr. Gamarudi? Very soon, very soon. Soon, it turned out, will be tomorrow at a news conference at the Iranian embassy. But the presence of Mr. Gamarudi in Britain is unlikely to stop the deportations. The plane which had brought him in took three more Iranian students, all women, back to Iran. Twenty have now been deported, and the Home Secretary is expected to sign deportation orders on another 24. Reports from Turkey say an army captain has been killed in the southern city of Adana, the first military casualty since the coup on Friday. Generally, military rule has halted political terrorism. And as Christopher Morris reports, in Ankara, there's been no resistance to the country's new leaders. Over two days since the coup, and not a single shot has yet been fired. And such is the relaxation of tension in Ankara that many of the tanks have been withdrawn, which had taken up positions at strategic road junctions and outside official buildings. It's quite remarkable how quickly life in the Turkish capital has been getting back to normal. People once more flocking onto the streets. The only noticeable difference in the shopping centres are the patrols of soldiers mingling with the crowds, not unlike the daily scene in Belfast in Northern Ireland. But the present calm is nevertheless an uneasy one. His military strongman, General Evren, who's now proclaimed himself head of state, ponders the country's future. He's abolished the government, shut down the parliament building and ordered the arrest of hundreds of MPs, trade union leaders of the left and right and known terrorist leaders. The last important political leader, still at large, surrendered after a series of raids by the army. First, they went to the headquarters of the neo-fascist Nationalist Action Party. The leader, Mr. Turkesh, had fled. Nor was he found when troops later searched his flat on the outskirts of Ankara. But after General Evren had personally issued an ultimatum to Turkesh to give himself up by one o'clock, he came out of hiding. Later, he left to go into voluntary internal exile, protective custody, the army called it, joining the deposed prime minister and opposition leader who've already been banished to remote areas of Turkey. The threat of a national dock strike grew today when Liverpool dockers reaffirmed their decision to call a nationwide stoppage in support of 178 of their colleagues who are due to be made redundant. The Liverpool port employers say there are too many dockers and not enough work. But the dock workers say the redundancies would breach an agreement negotiated eight years ago. From Liverpool, David Davis. Around 3,000 of Liverpool's 7,000 dockers attended today's meeting, which lasted an hour in the city's boxing stadium. And when it was over, they'd been assured of the support of dockers in several other ports around Britain if they pressed ahead with strike action. The Liverpool redundancies were announced after several employers went out of business. But the unions are adamant that they breached the agreement reached after the last national dock strike and negotiated by the former union leader, Mr Jack Jones, which ended casual labour in Britain's ports. We're saying you stick to the agreement you made with us. We've lost 23,000 jobs. There's no work in Merseyside. What are you going to do, turn Merseyside into a grouse mark? Despite today's vote, the employers remain confident of negotiating a settlement. Meanwhile, national union leaders will decide tomorrow whether to give official backing to the strike call. Captain Mark Phillips has been slightly injured during horse trials in Somerset. He was thrown from his horse during an event in Chard and cut his left hand. With his arm in a sling, he was helped to an ambulance. It took him to hospital in Taunton and he was released after treatment and an X-ray. Rugby League, rarely seen south of Doncaster, came to London today with the entry of Fulham into this traditionally northern preserve. The third division soccer club, worried about falling attendances, has bought an experienced side for less than the cost of one modest soccer player. 
Rugby league has been tried in the capital before, in the 30s, but it never really caught on. David Cass saw the Londoners debut. Never before has a league football club established a rugby team. But, not allowed Sunday soccer and suffering small crowds, Fulham were willing to try anything to get the paying public through the turnstiles. The well-known Wigan side were the perfect visitors to bring in the fans to get the rugby league venture off to a good start. They flooded in, 10,000 of them. If they didn't pack the ground to the capacity once enjoyed by soccer, they did double the average Saturday gait. Soccer fans among them admitted that the atmosphere was considerably more friendly, off the field anyway, than in the average soccer crowd. On the field, Fulham in the black shirt raced to a surprisingly easy victory and are now favourites to win the second division. For the fans, it was a good day out. For Fulham, an injection of cash. We've taken £30,000. More money than we've taken in three uh, football games. It must prove that our uh, executives on the FA are wrong to have uh, soccer uh, in August and soccer on Saturday. They should give the public what they want. Do you not think, though, that this large crowd today might mainly be about curiosity? Of course, but if we can retain only a part of it, we're over 10,000 already and they're still coming in. The Wigan fans couldn't share Mr Clay's enthusiasm as their team was thrashed by 24 points to five. The Fulham fans were delighted, naturally, but everything was right for this inaugural match. The true test will come on a rainy Sunday in February. A man has been charged tonight with the murder of Middlesbrough soccer fan Craig Fretch. Cleveland police say a man will appear before Teesside magistrates tomorrow. 17-year-old Craig died from head injuries shortly after Middlesbrough's home game with Nottingham Forest just over a week ago. Reports are being prepared for the FA and Essex police after what's thought to be an unprecedented incident when a policeman held up the third division soccer match between Colchester and Millwall. He intervened when he heard a player swearing at a goalkeeper. Christopher Powell reports. The officer stopped the game to caution Millwall player Mel Blythe after he'd used some very colourful language to urge his goalkeeper to get off the goal line. The officer's action has been described as courageous by the Police Federation Secretary Jim Jardine. He said the policeman was very worried about bad language causing trouble amongst the supporters. But the Federation's MP, Alden Griffiths, suggested that the action might have been overzealous. And the player has described suggestions that he could have incited the fans as unbelievable. He told me what had happened. The policeman walked on, stopping the play, and um, came over to me. What was your reaction to that? As I say, I was I was flabbergasted. I, could, I just couldn't I couldn't believe it. You know, I, I didn't even think he was coming over towards me at first because um, I, I didn't even think I'd done anything, which I still don't know. But um, obviously he did. What did he actually say to you? I didn't really catch what he was. Uh, but obviously he was. <laughs> he wanted to make his point. <laughs> Do you feel that he should have come on the pitch? No, no way. Motor racing and the Italian Grand Prix at Imola has seen a change at the top of the championship table with only two more championship races to go. The Brazilian Nelson Piquet took the lead after four laps. Then the end of the race for Canadian Gilles Villeneuve. Neither Villeneuve, who was left sitting in half his Ferrari, nor Bruno Giacomelli in an Alfa Romeo was hurt. At the end of the 60 laps, Piquet had pulled out his lead over Australian Alan Jones, who had been leading the championship table until now in his Saudi Williams. Jones now trails his Brazilian rival by one point. Carlos Reutemann, third in the race, is also third in the championship. The 150th anniversary of the world's first intercity train service between Liverpool and Manchester has been celebrated in style today. The world's oldest working locomotive, the Lion, hauled a special train and among the passengers were the Home Secretary, Mr William Whitelaw, and the BR Chairman, Sir Peter Parker. This report from Malcolm Balin. The Lion chugged into Manchester at all of 10 miles an hour and his passengers seemed keen to celebrate their journey's end.
Accompanied by Sir Peter Parker, Mr Whitelaw emerged with the Green Guards flag with which he'd waved the train off. Some passengers were decked out in period costume. But for Mr Whitelaw, today's celebrations differed from the 1830 opening ceremony. One of the first MPs to travel on the line was knocked over by Stevenson's rocket. But the Home Secretary was carefully shepherded through the crowds and emerged unscathed from his ordeal. Six weeks of celebration have attracted over 100,000 visitors and the Greater Manchester Council says it's only a beginning. They've bought the Liverpool Road Station for a pound and hope to turn it into a £4 million museum. And that's the news tonight. Good night. <laughs>